friends, my name is Stevie Cade and welcome to Film Trigger. I had the privilege and the honor to see the Batman for the fan screening that came out three days before the movie was released. It was an incredible experience for me. They didn't play any trailers or nothing. It was pretty cool. And we definitely have a lot to talk about here. But before we do, head down to that like, thumbs up, the subscribe button, and the little bell ding thing so you get notified every time I upload a new video. Without further ado, let's dive into my review for the PG-13 reboot of Seven starring the Batman. Okay, yeah, I made I made a little seven joke there. We'll dive in a little later to why I made that joke. This is a spoiler-free video, so don't worry. We won't give up any of the goods here. Uh, I will have a spoiler discussion on my channel in just a couple of days with a couple of really cool guests, but we will announce that on Drive-By News this Sunday. Anyway, I'm sure by now you've heard across the board, people compliment the hell out of this movie for pretty much all the same reasons. I am going to retread probably what you've heard before of some of the things that I like, but I do think I have a unique take of why it took me a while to get this review out. I should have had this review out three days ago, but I had a hard time connecting where I sat with this movie. But first, let's dive into what I do like about this movie. The cinematography, it's beautiful, it's captivating. It's just got a darkness and a grittiness that you haven't quite seen before. And trust me, we've seen grounded Batmans before, but this is a little different. This is beyond grounded. This is like below grounded, if that makes sense. It's like a fantastical twist on being grounded, but this is definitely one of the best looking Batman movies I've ever seen across the board. The cinematography just really works with the tone and the story being told here. And that story is one heck of a good one about Batman rediscovering himself. And he's discovering himself by watching the cause and effects of his actions and how Gotham is dealing with his presence in the city for the past couple of years. This Batman has yet to discover his different sides. The isolated being that he is compared to the humanized Bruce Wayne that he's trying to search for. Maybe we're not so different. Who are you under there? He goes through the hero's journey in this movie, which we've seen, but this one comparatively really reminds me of the amazing Spider-Man. When that Spider-Man saved the kid on the bridge, and then he realized that Spider-Man was more than just being a vigilante hunting down people that look like his Uncle Ben's killer. No, it could be more than that. He can be a hero. He could be a savior to the city. And there's that realization that Batman has in this movie. It's not as quick, but it's not as a slow burn as you usually see during a hero's journey. The city of Gotham is a living, breathing space. It's very reminiscent of the Tim Burton Gotham City in my mind, just like the feel of it, but it seems more modernized and somehow more fantastical, like in its gritty dreariness. I keep going back to that. I keep going back to how dark and gritty this movie is, but also how fantastical it hints at being. Very interesting concept. I never really thought about that until I started recording this, but it definitely has that yin and yang element in this movie. The action is on point. We didn't have to deal with that bad editing fighting style that we got with the Nolan films. The pacing is incredible. Like the movie's three hours long and I had no clue. Like when it ended, I thought it was ending early. I'm like, I thought this was three hours. Oh my God, it's been three hours. That is a positive aspect and usually comes from a movie that's entertaining, fun, and captures your attention. Colin Farrell as the Penguin. This dude stole the show every time he was on screen. It was very much like Robert Downey Jr. and Tropic Thunder. Like, you know that's Robert Downey Jr., but like, it looks and sounds nothing like Robert Downey Jr. And look at it a little closely and go, oh yeah, I do see Robert Downey Jr. This, nope, not even a smidgen, not even a hint. I cannot tell Colin Farrell was in this movie at all. If they didn't tell us, no one would have guessed it either. And he just did a great job. Like, not just the fact that he was hiding who he was and completely immersing himself in the role, but the character Penguin was really just he just stole the show he was a lot of fun to watch interact with a very interesting person and it really made me excited for the hbo max series starring colin farrell as the penguin i'm really excited for that series now and i cannot wait especially since they announced it's going to be a very mature rating for the tv show zoe kravitz as catwoman okay well we get another grounded catwoman <laughs> Um, I am a huge Michelle Pfeiffer fan, always has been. She is this, something about her Catwoman is, it's sensual, it's anarchy, it's toxic, it's pretty much all of my relationships. She's just trying to hustle her way through the city the only way she knows how, and, and that's in a very dishonest, you know, 
sort of way. Her character is actually pretty subdued in this movie when it comes to her personality, but cats typically take their time when warming up to a new person, and that's kind of how this cat woman is acting. I'm not saying there's some, you know, magical cat you know, parallel that she has, but I believe that was a conscious acting choice. She approaches dealing with working with Batman in a very cat like way, you know, just kind of like hanging around in the outskirts, watching, waiting. Can I trust this guy? We'll see. We'll find out. Although when her and Batman do start sparking up a, a relationship, I do feel a little differently about that, but we'll discuss that here in just a moment. Let's continue with the cast and characters and let's talk about Jeffrey Wright as Gordon. This is a good Gordon. It's a solid Gordon. It's nothing to write home about. It's nothing magical. Nobody's going to win an Oscar in this movie except maybe Colin Farrell. But he's a solid Commissioner Gordon. He's grisly. You can tell he's beaten down by the city. He's just an honest cop doing his thing. And now he trusts this guy who dresses as a bat. Why not? Because it's fucking Gotham City. They obviously have a seasoned relationship in this movie. I know we think we've seen that before, but we actually haven't seen the level of friendship that they have in this movie in the previous movies it seems like batman and commissioner gordon have this wall in between them, but there's something dividing them and that's the strong arm of the law in this movie they break down that wall they work together as a team gordon goes out on a limb and defends having batman at these crime scenes with him because he understands and respects his detective capabilities they seem to stand alone yet together and i think that's a wonderful adaptation of these two characters i mean batman himself is a very isolated person in this movie he has very few actual human moments uh, and they do progress as the movie goes on and again that's the hero's journey that's part of his self-discovery but the way it works when he's with gordon he's actually working with the police department at the crime scene surrounded by police officers who do not trust him who do not want him to be there he is distrusted and feared by the police just as much as he is the criminals and commissioner gordon is the only bridge that's keeping them being civil and even that becomes trying at certain points in this movie there's always tension when Batman is around in this movie. Awkward. Again, that tension is fueled by Batman's isolation in this movie. He has a hard time connecting with that human side of himself. There are a few times in this movie where he makes eye contact with a kid and he just kind of stares at the kid. And I won't give the details of why, but he relates to this kid. If you are justice, please do not lie. And this does something very unique, something that no Batman movie has ever done before. And that makes me believe that a Robin could exist in this universe, in this very grounded universe that Matt Reeves has laid out. A Robin being in this universe makes sense because of how they're laying this ground with Batman's empathy with kids who have also lost major parts of their lives. And I'll add this on my what I like list. Uh, I think the bat suit looks great. I don't know if I'm a fan of the collar exactly. This continues. It won't be long before you've nothing left. And with that is the Batmobile. Again, not my favorite Batmobile. I'm like the guy who likes the tank Batmobiles. The bigger, the better. That's just my style. But I do respect this iteration. I do respect this muscle car. It's kind of a callback to the 1960s Batman, which is another thing that I like about this movie is there are subtle callbacks to the 1960s Batman. And I remember when I first heard about this, I was like, how are you going to take inspiration to the 1960s Batman and turn it into a dark noir, you know, detective style movie? That doesn't even make sense. But they pulled it off. The inspiration was aesthetic. There are subtle nuances throughout the entire movie that just remind you, oh, yeah, the 1960s existed and they're acknowledging it. The style and tone of this movie are just spectacular. It's a dark, brooding, detective noir style movie, and it's a beautiful take on Batman. This movie just dives deep into the noir. This movie feels like it's the best adaptation to give us that full rogues gallery, Arkham game sort of vibe Batman. Like for instance, we might get a Mr. Freeze in the next film, which how do you take Mr. Freeze and not have him be a super fantastical king? That's a tough one, but I would really like to see what Matt Reeves would do with this and to make it as grounded as he possibly could with a character that extreme. And that's what I like about this movie. It's going to push the boundaries of what we consider to be grounded and fantastical 
And that's a theme that is continuing through many aspects of this movie. The way that I picture it is the grounded aspect of Batman is going to be his detective noir style of storytelling that Matt Reeves is doing here, which is actually going to lead me to what I'm on the fence about when it comes to this movie, and that's the noir style, the 1990s graphic cop film that it's trying to emulate here is kind of inconsistent in certain parts. Uh, for instance, there's a narration by Batman throughout the movie, but it's just kind of there. There's no real explanation of why it's there. It's just your classic noir style. And she walked into the room. We locked eyes. I haven't forgot her face since. When that light hits the sky, it's not just a call, it's a warning. I just wish they would have shown me like Batman writing in a journal or keeping notes of why he's just randomly talking to himself. But even with that, it was inconsistent because he wasn't doing it throughout the whole movie. It was just here and there. And we need some exposition to get us from one part to the next. And it wasn't done in a lazy way. It was just done in a, well, we need some exposition. So let's just have Batman narrate it in a noir style. Because <laughs> this is a noir movie. Noir. Saying that word a lot. Noir. 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 And another area that I'm definitely on the fence about is how much they did take from the seven movie, put it into this one. I mean, there's, uh, listen, I understand there's inspirations. Joker had a major inspiration from the Scorsese films, uh, specifically the comedian, which is made into a Joker story. This did the same thing. And I don't know if I like this trend. At one point in time, I really thought they were going to do like, what's in the box with Batman? I really did. I thought they were gonna pull that off this movie seems like a PG-13 reboot of Seven starring Batman. Honestly, you take the Batman character, you take the Jim Gordon character, they are Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt from Seven, then you toss in the Riddler who is pretty much John Doe from Seven. Now, I've never seen Zodiac, so I can't really make the comparison. The Seven vibe is just really strong and maybe a little too much so. I'm just here to unmask the truth about this cesspool we call a city. I've been trying to Andy Serkis as Alfred. Now, why am I on the fence with Andy Serkis as Alfred? He's a good actor, right? Yeah, of course he is. When he's on screen, which he's not <laughs> on screen very much in this movie. They kind of benched him in this movie, and that's not fully why I'm on the fence, because I kind of understand why they benched him in this movie. This is a villain-focused movie. So a lot of their backstories, a lot of their development is with the villain characters, but I kind of wish we would have seen a little bit more Andy Serkis as Alfred because there was a disconnect between his Alfred and this Bruce Wayne. There was some tension there. As I said, there's always tension when Batman's around, but it's unexplained tension. You start to question, well, did Alfred help him become Batman? Where does he fit into him being Batman? Is he kind of an Oracle character or does he just stay out of it? Some questions that hopefully that they dive into a little further as the sequels come out. But in this movie, he seemed a little benched and it left a lot of questions of where he stands in this Batman universe. And on top of that, at no point in time should Alfred seem like he could beat up Batman. And any circus playing Alfred looks like he can beat up Robert Pattinson's Batman. <laughs> like, Alfred should never be bigger than Batman. I'm just, I'm just gonna throw that out there. So maybe in the future, let's not hire Alfreds that are bigger than Batman, okay? Good. I mean, hell, it's not even Andy Serkis' fault. I'm gonna say, Robert Pattinson as Batman just physically looks tiny, he looks small. I love the bat suit, but he looks lost in it. I know this is gonna sound like a negative, and I swear I'm not trying to make this a negative, but seeing Robert Pattinson in that bat suit in certain shots, not in the majority of the movie, just in small little snippets here and there, <laughs> he looks like how confident a four-year-old is when they're in their favorite superhero's costume for like trick or treat or something like that. That confidence is what Robert Pattinson's Batman reminds me of, as I said, just in certain parts, especially coming from Ben Affleck's Batman, which was a fucking gargantuan beast. The cat and bat relationship, with those two getting involved with each other and doing what they do in this movie together just seems really freaking rushed. It's not a bad relationship. It doesn't take me out of the movie, but it is a little rushed in the beginning. Not really what I expected to happen in a three hour movie. Maybe we could have spent a little bit more time building that relationship between Catwoman and Batman. Paul Dano as Riddler. So like I'm 50-50 with this guy. 
in all the trailers, how they portray this Riddler very theatrical. He has a stance, he sounds confident, and he comes across as a fearful character. And then there's another part they don't show in the trailer, and I'm not gonna go into spoiler territory, but his character changes. And it makes sense in the movie why, but it's such a drastic change. It's just hard for me to grasp onto as, okay, that's the same Riddler as this guy? They're, 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 the, they're the same people? Okay, all right, I guess I'm following you here. And then his character got so theatrical at one point in time that it turned me off. Then he starts singing and I'm like, why is he singing? In this moment right now, why is he singing? And that's when it connected with me. And this must be how people feel about Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor. Because I love Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. It's wife hands down favorite Lex Luthor. And I get a lot of shit for it and I don't understand why. But now watching this movie, people love this Riddler but I feel like I'm on the other side of the hate train on this because I don't like this Riddler. I'm not a big fan of him, or at least 50% of him. If I look at it through the lens that this must be how people look at Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor, then I guess I can understand why people like this Riddler. But for me, it just doesn't hit the mark on the latter half of the film. And not to mention, they kind of did a ripoff of Nolan's Joker. You know, the whole handheld camera film thing that the joke that Joker did in The Dark Knight. They did that, except it wasn't just a handheld camera. It was just social media, like TikTok or something like that. But it was very reminiscent of what Joker did in The Dark Knight. And this leads me into what I don't like about this movie. And that's, I've seen this movie before. Not in its entirety, of course, that's not what I mean. And besides the seven comparison, it's not a copy and paste of any other Batman movie that I've seen, but there are bits and pieces in this film that remind me of bits and pieces of all other Batman movies. I recognize this shot from BVS. I recognize this line from the Nolan series. I recognize that from Tim Burton's film. It almost ruined the movie for me. This is why I waited a few days to, to actually record my review because I had a hard time understanding where I sat with this movie because I really enjoyed the movie. I thought the movie was a lot of fun but I came out not happy with my experience I, because I felt like I just watched a movie take a whole bunch of ideas from other movies, put them in this and present it as, as its own creative property. And I felt robbed. I felt like I was being gypped. And then I came to the conclusion that I'm looking at that wrong. I am not looking at a movie that was a ripoff of its predecessors, no. I was looking at a movie whose source material has been cherry picked throughout the entirety of its cinematic franchise, which means I think we're about out of ideas. I'm starting to recognize, okay, well this movie cherry picked from these comics, just like this movie cherry picked from the same comic. So now I'm starting to recognize the parallel, don't do that. Now I'm starting to recognize the parallels between them and it's not the movie's fault exactly because they're just going with them source material. So I can't blame and fault the movie for it, but I'll tell you what, my first day and a half after coming out of this movie, I was really just not happy with my experience because of that. But I'm glad I was able to identify that's what it was. I don't like the fact that I'm getting property fatigue of the Batman, but for crying out loud, how many reboots has he had? Moving forward, the only way they can escape from this commonality with the previous films is to give us something we truly haven't seen, which they tried with the Detective Noir, but they need to stop cherry picking from the same comics that we've seen before. You wanna go into the rogues gallery? Perfect. Let's dive into this Arkham world and bring them out in a grounded, gritty way, but also, again, as fantastical as you could possibly bring to this grounded world. Even though I understand why Matt Reeves went the grounded route, again, I'm just fatigued of seeing a grounded Batman in these movies. That's why I really, really enjoy Zack Snyder's version of Batman because he was something new we haven't seen before. This is a Batman that's fighting aliens and was potentially going to go into outer space and helping take down interdimensional beings. Like, that was the Batman I was ready to see, something we haven't seen before. Then that got fucking severed and out of the ashes of what was supposed to be Ben Affleck's movie, we got this movie, which went right back to where we've been before, another grounded adaptation. It's a bit exhausting. It sucks because I really do like this movie. So hopefully moving forward or even upon a second view, I will see this movie in a better light because I'll take that lens off of 
blaming the movie for stealing other concepts and just watch it for what it actually is. One other thing that I really, really don't like in this movie, and it's probably like the biggest thing I don't like, and I can't even exactly tell you how it happens because it kind of is spoiler, but I'll put it this way. Batman flying or gliding is one of the grossest things I've ever seen Batman do. I, I just do not like it. I understand it. The most grounded way you could do it without creating technology like the Nolan series did. Wait till my spoiler discussion, because when I do have my spoiler discussion, I am going to rip this a new asshole. But just know, Batman gliding in this movie sucks for me. Number one, there is a post credit scene. Number two, don't wait for it. Waste of your fucking time. And I know me saying this right now, you're going to go, well, but it's a post credit scene. Of course I'm going to stay for it. And then you're going to sit and you're going to stay for it. Then you're going to look at the screen going, well, maybe I should have listened to Stevie. Okay. Oops. Listen to me now. Don't wait for the post credit scene. You're welcome. Overall, this is a fan-made film, and that fan happens to be Matt Reeves. This is what I've derived out of all my dreading and out of all my thinking and pacing the floors and wondering how I'm going to rate this movie. I finally come to the conclusion that we got a high-budget fan film. I mean that in the most respectful way possible. It's very much a positive in this film. That doesn't make it my favorite Batman movie, but it's definitely not a bad Batman movie. It's a really good Batman movie. It's got great action, wonderful storytelling and pacing, supreme cinematography, a decent score. I didn't really talk about the score, which I, if you know my channel, I usually don't talk about scores unless they pop out at me. This one eh, didn't really pop out at me. I know, weird. But a slightly inconsistent tone and the pollution of an oversaturated property did affect my movie going experience. And this is about the time I want to steal a page out of Sean Chandler's book <laughs> and give this movie two gratings. <laughs> it's a good thing he does. And now I understand why he does it. Again, I have to take out what kind of ruined this movie for me out of the actual grading because it's not the movie's fault. That's just property fatigue. So for all these reasons, I'm giving this movie a solid A. That was wonderful. Bravo. I loved that. That was great. Well, it was pretty good. There you have it. My review for The Batman. We'll be doing a spoiler talk of this movie on Monday. We will be doing a spoiler free on Sunday for Drive-By News, which starts at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Number one, have you seen this movie? Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Do you think I'm a madman for coming out feeling fatigued of this property? Do you think this movie's overrated? Just a little bit, maybe? Getting a little overhyped? Very possible. Or am I fucking nuts and this is the greatest Batman you've ever seen before and I just need to shut my mouth and just enjoy it for what it is? Let me know all of that in the comments below. Also, be sure to check out some more of my videos. And as always, stay trigger happy, my friends. Peace. I'm vengeance.